nice hand for Wes. Got you all worked up in a lather. It's a warm him up, Wes. Get him going. That was great. What was that, three minutes? What do you... Anyway, it's nice they dropped the charges and let me come back to Puckett's, you know? Apparently, you have to wear pants when you eat here. Who knew? I was thinking about... Uh, it, it, um, Lenny Bruce told a story uh, about uh, working small towns in the Midwest, and uh, 7 a.m., some mayor's wife would call him up, and she'd say, oh, did I wake you? And he'd say, no, I always like to get up 12 hours before I go to work. So this is 12 hours before I normally go to work. So anyway, a little bit about myself, and then we'll move on. I'm uh, 66 years old. I have Medicare, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, got my Medicare card, told my wife I'm going to the doctor. She says, what's wrong? I said, I don't know, it's 12 bucks, I'm going every day, baby. <laughs> a lot of old guys go to the park and feed the pigeons. I'm going to a urologist. <laughs> Something's gonna break and I'm gonna be right there when it does. I'm just gonna walk over, hold it out. Is, uh, do I need this? It just fell off. Do I need this? Because that's, a, I'm, a, I'm a functioning hypochondriac. Function, I'm not clinical. Those people are really sick, they're mentally ill. This is how God protects his children. It's my ADHD that I have that keeps my hypochondria manageable. <laughs> Think about it. I have days, I do, I convince myself I need an ambulance. By the time I get to the phone to call one, I'm distracted four or five times. So <laughs> stand in the kitchen, got a telephone, can't remember why I picked up a telephone, and that's when I would order the pizza. So <laughs> when I tell you my kids loved me, they loved me. Dad's dying again. Pepperoni! Come on. So. <laughs> That's the way it works. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I have two grown boys. I have four grandchildren, ages nine down to six. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Tammy, for 36 consecutive years, all in a row. Thank you very much. Uh, it's 223. I married an entertainer years. So, and uh, some more things more personal. I'm a recovering addict, drug addict, alcoholic. Uh, uh, 27 years ago, we filed bankruptcy. My wife and I lost everything financially. 25 years ago, Tammy said to me one morning, if things don't improve in our marriage, she was going to file for divorce. And I only tell you this because I draw most of my comedy from my life experience. And that's a few of the highlights we'll cover this morning. That's right. Alcoholism, bankruptcy, and divorce. So strap on your party hats, guys. <laughs> Mr. Sunshine drove all the way here from Fairview just to cheer you up. I love fair. By the way, we got our first traffic light about 12 years ago. There were 17 accidents the first week we had a light. <laughs> Apparently, the locals couldn't figure out why there was a floating red dot in the sky just driving along. That's new, Edna. <laughs> oh, make a note. I live next door to a 79-year-old uh, uh, lady. Um, uh, she lost her husband. Uh, well, she didn't lose it. We know right where he is. He's not going anywhere. So uh, we plunked him down a while ago. But I tell you this because last July, this summer, we, uh, we were out mowing our lawns. I have a couple acres. She's got a few, and we're out there mowing around. And uh, we, we meet at the fence. We're having a conversation, and uh, Tammy, my wife, saw that, came out with some iced tea. So this is why I like living where I live. I, mean, I know my neighbor, and uh, she's not going to call the FBI on me because uh, I'm wearing a red hat, you know. And uh, <laughs> it's him. So uh, anyway, in the middle of our conversation, she said she had to take a cognitive test to get her license renewed in Tennessee. And I thought, cognitive? Why are you? She's sharp. She is. She's a sharp old gal. And she said, well, the memory part threw me. And I, I said, memory? They test you for that? Why, why, why would they? What does memory have to do with driving ability? I mean, you know, just because you get lost, who cares if you get lost? You know, as long as you don't hit other people. I mean, that should be the important thing. Anyway, I said, what's the test? She said, they give you five things, and 20 minutes later, you got to recall all five things. And my wife looked at me and said, you're never hanging on to your license. And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, the grocery store is eight minutes from our house. I give you three things to remember. How many times are you calling me nine minutes later asking me what the three things are? And I thought about it, and I said, you know, you're right. I have been, you know. Uh, so now I've been studying since July for my cognitive test. Um, when I go to Publix, I won't call my wife. I won't let her text me. I'm bringing home the three things. Uh, granted, times I come home with 20 things hoping the three things are in there. I mean, it, we have a lot of butter in our house, a lot of butter. Matter Matter of fact, you have dinner with us, we give you a stick for the ride home. It's just, who doesn't like butter? Take it with you. Lard is, lard is good. So 
I'm worried about my memory. That's my point. And I'm up here with no notes because I'm, I'm trying to, to help. with. Uh, that's kind of what the point of that was. And I'm worried about it. And then I saw an ad on TV for a pill called Prevagen, which was a natural pill. And I love the commercial. There's some old guy comes out and goes, I remember everything now. And his wife goes, he does. I'm telling you, man, the commercial's that compelling. <laughs> and I was ready to buy the Prevagen, and then the, the announcer said that it's, the key ingredient comes from the oil of a jellyfish. And I looked at Tammy and said, do jellyfish have good memories? I mean, <laughs> how do they even know that? Did some guy in a lab coat look at the blob swimming in the water and go, I wonder if it could help us remember our grocery lists. Let's line the ocean floor with Sudoku and see how the job does. I mean... It's trivia night at the bar. No way. I saw six jellyfish go in. We'll never beat them at trivia. <laughs> Come on. The only time you've ever laid eyes on a jellyfish, they're on the shore gasping for life because they forgot to go back out with the tide. <laughs> the one thing a jellyfish needs to remember is water. They survive, and they're sitting there four feet away going, oh, we're forgetting something, Herbie. I don't know what it is. <laughs> That's how I know evolution is suspect. Just suspect. After millions of years of dying on the shore four feet from survival, You'd think jellyfish would have evolved feet by now. Not big human feet, just little jellyfish feet so they can kind of catch the water. Maybe even a jelly roll. <laughs> there you go. That's a joke, by the way. I don't need a three-page email and uh, poking holes in my evolutionary theory, you know. Boy needs some help. So anyway, um, uh, I met my wife, Tammy. People ask, you know, how do you, how, where we met. She was a waitress at a comedy club back in... Um, in the 80s, and uh, she was a smoker, uh, and I don't care what anybody says, smokers have the best laughs. I mean, when you cannot get oxygen into your lungs, that's, that's music to a comic's ear. So I'm on stage, and I hear this beautiful laugh in the back of the room, you know, and I'm thinking it's a woman, and she digs me. I'm going to find out who it is, and I walk back, and I asked for the woman who couldn't breathe, and they all knew who it was, and... Uh, she was back changing clothes. She came out, and I don't know which, if you remember what your wife was wearing the first time you laid, but I'll never forget. I mean, she was five foot ten, uh, and after 36 years with me, she's now five seven. So, give you the idea of the burden of living with me. It's not three inches off her height, but back then it was all legs, short leather skirt, white blouse, permed here. I mean, it was the 80s, permed here. I bumped into her. Four dove flew out of her hair. I mean, <laughs> I knew it was the one. So. And I was living in L.A., she was living in Ohio, and um, I went back to L.A., and uh, my relationships with women prior to that was pretty simple. I'd meet them on a Tuesday at a club, and we'd spend a week together, and then I'd move on and go out and, and find to the next town and find another one, you know. And uh, when I got back to California, something about her was different. She had a two-year-old son. She was a single mom. She was working two jobs, which was impressive to me, because I could barely do the one job I had. And... Um, uh, we, we started up a relationship, and I flew her and a kid out to me uh, to meet me in L.A. in January. And I played dad for a week, uh, and I thought I could do this. Um, and uh, I was flying to uh, Ohio to meet up with her on, in April on a red eye. And uh, I had, but somewhere over in Nebraska, I figured, I decided I'm going to ask her to marry me. I had no ring. I had no, never even thought of marriage before. I just thought, well, that's a good idea. Let's, let's do that. So I'm waiting for the luggage, and I say to her, I love you, Tammy. I love Aaron, and uh, do you want to get married? And Tammy looks at me and goes, uh, pardon me? And I said, do you want to get married, you and I, and uh, raise a family together? And she said, uh, yeah, I guess if that's what you want. <laughs> that's how excited she was at the process. I'm not kidding you. That's, uh, it's no different if I said, you want to go to McDonald's for breakfast? Yeah, if that's what you want. You know, you want <laughs> You want to get married? That's how dead we were as people. We really were. The most life-altering decision a man and woman can make, two of them. Uh, either you could decide to get married and raise a family or divorce and end that family. These are two life-altering decisions. And we were, it was as if, again, we were going to go out to breakfast. So anyway, that's how we decided. We got the luggage and we left. And I can tell you, she had no idea the baggage she picked up that day. <laughs> that's right. Alcoholic, drug addict, and rage freak. Uh, good combination. If, I, if they had dating apps back then, that would have been my profile, if I was honest. Alcoholic, drug addict with rage issues, looking for a uh, white, single female to overlook aforementioned character flaws. That would have been my profile. You know. And uh, we moved to Boston. Um, uh, I wrote a bad check to get into the apartment we had. 
And to give you an example of the kind of person I was, I, I had to do a show that night. I did a show, and they tell me you're going to get paid next week. I said, I can't get paid next week. i got to cover the check I just wrote today to get into our apartment. And they said, well, he doesn't pay for a week. I said, what's his address? I, dra I bit, almost dragged him out of bed and beat him in his front yard to get the check out of him. But he, he paid me. And that Christmas, that was in the summer of 86, uh, and <laughs> that Christmas, I got a Christmas card, which I kept in my desk drawer for years. It, it was addressed to Mr. and Mrs. Psycho. Uh, that's, that, was, that was the nickname they gave me in Boston, was Psycho, and I wore it with pride. I was a, a raving lunatic. And um, a couple of highlights. Uh, uh, well, first, uh, I did my first all-nighter. We weren't even married a month. I came waltzing through the door about 10.30 in the morning. My wife was on the phone crying with a club owner because there were no cell phones back then, so I couldn't have communicated with her, so she thought I was somewhere dead. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, a new bride. Uh, and uh, by the way, I asked her to marry me in April. She got pregnant in May, and we got married in July. So I went from single and traveling 50 weeks a year to a wife and two kids. Um, and um, anyway, uh, my first all-nighter. And then uh, I, there, there came a point where I realized I, I, uh, I'm going to either have to get rid of the marriage or I'm going to have to get rid of the, the, the booze and drugs. I can't keep doing both. And as a matter of fact, I shared with a friend of mine, I was about a year sober, and um, uh, he, was, he had the same issues I had, and he had a brand new baby. And I said, you're going to walk in one night, look at that kid in that crib, and you're going to do one of two things. You're going to flee, or you're going to get the help you need to take care of the responsibilities you have. And uh, he was living in Boston, and probably two months later, I found out he was living in San Francisco. So he fled. He went as far, and the ocean stopped him. Um, I was looking at those kids every night. I'd come home drunk, and I'd look at those kids, and the guilt, um, and the guilt. Uh, I never had guilt uh, until I got married and had children and responsibility. You know, I, I keep reading about how guilt's a bad thing. God gave us guilt uh, for a reason, not shame. Shame is not good. Shame says there's something wrong with me, which means God made a mistake with you. That's not healthy. Guilt is there's something I'm doing that uh, it, it basically the, the defying God's law, God's rules. And um, I was sitting in a room one night, um, drunk. I'll give you a couple. I, um, one night I'm leaving the club, and I'm going to do some cocaine to get a, to, for the ride home. And as I'm bending over in front of the club in my car to do the cocaine, there's a rap on the window, and I look up, and there's a Boston policeman there. And he shines the light in, and he, and he says, get out of the car. And we get out of the car. And he radios. He said, yeah, he was doing cocaine. So they're cuffing me and putting me in a cruiser. And um, the off-duty policeman who was working the club as security came out to smoke a cigarette. And he saw me getting put in a cruiser. And he said, what, what are you doing with him? And he said, well, he was doing cocaine. He's going in. And the off-duty cop says, well, let him go. He's one of the comedians, as if that's a get-out-of-jail-free card. <laughs> you know? And it turns out it was, because they took the cuffs off and got me out. And the policeman leaned over, and he said, you have no idea how lucky you are. You were looking at three to five. The uh, DA is up for re-election, and they love parading white suburban boys in front of the camera right before election time. You were going down and going down hard. And I had a six-month-old at home. Uh, and you think that would kind of scare you enough to reconsider some of your habits. But about four nights later, I was so drunk, I, was, I went up the wrong ramp uh, to the interstate, and I was driving into traffic at uh, 2 or 3 in the morning. Fortunately, it was 2 or 3 in the morning, and there weren't a lot of cars, and it, I realized that the headlights were coming at me, and I, I somehow managed to back down from where I came. And My drive home was normally 35 or 40 minutes. It took me three and a half hours to get home because I wound up at Cape Cod. I had no idea where I was. And driving in that condition. Uh, I think back on the way I drove for years. Um, there was a 20-year period. I don't think I, I drove. I was inebriated at certain levels uh, constantly. And to not have hurt other people is a, um, it's, it's just grace. I, I don't know how else to explain it. There's no other reason for it. But you think that would be one, you know. But um, anyway, there was probably a month later, and I knew I was, I, I had to quit. I mean, it was just constantly in the back of my head. And again, I come home every night, I look at what my responsibilities are, and they're just overwhelming. And um, I came home one night, and I realized that 
um, I was drinking and trying to figure out where all this guilt was coming from, and I realized it started with the marriage. So I got to get rid of the marriage. I can't. I'm done. We're not even married a year, and I'm done. And she's already got, she had one kid from another guy, and now she's got another kid from another guy. And I don't even think about that. I don't care. I just got to get out of this. And I'll send money. You know, I'm going to take care of my responsibilities financially. I just can't handle this. I just want to go do what I want to do. And uh, I got to figure out how to get out of it. I've never broke up with a girl in my life because it was too uncomfortable. I just fled. That's how I ended relationships. I just ignored them until the point where they, um, they stopped calling or they, you know, they, they figured it out. Now you're married, you just can't do that. And I don't have the courage to ask for a divorce. So I, in my sickness, I decided that if I dragged my wife out of bed and beat her, that she'd have to divorce me because what woman can live with a man that would do that? And um, anyway, I worked the courage up to go do that. And I'm standing over my wife, and that little voice that lives inside all of us, that God put in all of us, the conscience that we have, that little voice says, this is wrong. And I'm wrestling with what I want to do, what I need to do, and that voice. And in the process of all of that, my six-month-old son starts crying. And um, I gotta go quiet him down because he's gonna wake her up, and I, you know, I, I take away the whole plan, and I end up spanking him. And Tammy wakes up and she runs into the room and she says, "What are you doing?" I mean, you know, I mean, my God, who beats a six-month-old? You know, and she takes our son and she walks into the bedroom and sits on the end of the bed and she feeds him. He was crying because he was hungry, and the shame that had washed over me. It was something I'd never experienced before. I mean, I had been arrested, I'd been drunk tanks, I mean, but it's all part of the uh, drinking life, you know, it's just what you live with, you know. But uh, this was different. And I told my wife, if you don't take me to Alcoholics Anonymous, I won't go, and if I don't go, we're not gonna make it. She took me to a meeting the next day, and I walk in and they say, pray, I said, to what? And they said, find something in the universe larger than yourself. You're the reason you're here. And I like to think of this as God's journey, not mine. Because if, I had, if God had sat me down and said, this is what I'm going to put you and your wife through for the next seven or eight years. But at the end of that period, you're going to know Jesus Christ. And you're going to know a peace and a, and a love for each other that you never knew could exist. I'd have never signed on. God doesn't tell us his plans for that reason. But in hindsight, I can look back and see his hand in just about everything. And for me, the journey was about why. Why? I just don't understand why I did what I did, why I do what I do, why it mattered, why anything mattered. And if you're in a marriage today that's full of acrimony, wait till you get to apathy. Because the only way you can live with all of that responsibility without the tools to live with it is to shut down. And I shut down. What my wife had for a husband for seven years or eight years was a shell of a man. I wanted to be better. I had read all of the self-help books. I started with John Bradshaw stuff on family dynamics, I, Melody Beatty stuff on codependency. I, I, I did all the meetings, I did, I prayed. They told me to pray. They gave me the third step prayer. God, remove me from the bondage of myself so that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulty so that victory over them. Others may bear witness to thy strength, thy power, and thy way of life. The serenity prayer, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I did my 12 steps. I did everything I was supposed to do, and I was still raging and breaking and slamming and snotty and to the people I love. I was civil to the people outside of my home. I was not civil to the people I professed to love. And I didn't know why. That was the question, why? Why, why am I like, why? I, you know, and I, again, I, did, I went to therapy, I did all of that. I did, I did what I was supposed to do, I checked the boxes. We like to check boxes in America, we really do. You know, I, I had the 
if you check the boxes. I had a beautiful wife. I had kids that were healthy. I had a job I loved. I loved doing comedy. But I was miserable. So those boxes didn't matter. It didn't matter. I could find another beautiful person. I could get another family. I could go. That I knew intellectually. That wasn't going to be. It wasn't going to be a new round of people. The problem was in here. And it's interesting, I just finished the first manuscript on a book called Are We There Yet? And that's really what it was with me. I want to be there. I want to be done. I, I used to tell therapists that. When am I done with this? And the first therapist I went to said, well, you, right now you make some pretty shitty choices. So when you quit making those kind of choices, you can be your own therapist and you can get on with life. So I thought, that's great. That's intellectual. I can, I can handle that. I just got rotten toolbox, and I can put new tools in there, and I can function. But there was this thing missing inside. There was something inside of me. And, I, and, and Tammy couldn't get it. I couldn't get her to understand where I was at with my life. And, and, and I kept telling her, don't you, under, don't you ever wonder? She goes, wonder what? Why? Why, why we're here? The whole point to this. And I really, I, this will sound weird, but I, it was my kid's gerbil that really kind of opened my eyes up. I, it, isn't that strange? I mean, what God uses to, 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 to hit us. But I'd watch him gather sticks from one side of the crate and bring them over to the other, stack them up, and he'd stack them, stack them up, bring them over, and every now and then spin the wheel in the center. And Tammy comes in one day, and she goes, what's with you and the gerbil? I go, look at it. She goes, yeah, I've seen it. I bet, but no, watch it. Live. Sticks. Gather. Sticks. Gather. That's our life. And I said, I sit here, and I project the next 10, 15, 20 years of my life, and all I'm gathering is sticks. I'm buying things. They wear out. We take them to the landfill. We buy more things. They go to the landfill. If I'm lucky, I get a sitcom or a movie deal. I make a lot of money. We get nicer things, nicer sticks, but they all wind up in the landfill. And our wheel is Vegas or uh, Disney or we, for entertainment. She goes, what are you talking about? I go, if that's my life for the next 15 years, I'm out. I'm done. And she looked at me and said, you checked out years ago, pal. You haven't been here for years. She said, I've been living alone for years. And it was the first time in our entire marriage she unloaded what living with me was like. And you want to... Ask your wife someday, no repercussions. What has life been like with me for the last 15, 20, 30 years? And just let her unload. I was sober enough, long enough to hear my wife for the first time. And all I could say to her was, I'm sorry. trying. We finally got to a point where we filled out divorce papers, had them notarized, and we're driving to the courthouse, and she changed her mind. Ten minutes. Twenty-some years ago, we filed those papers. I lose 25 years with, with her. And um, my life changed when I met a man. He was a businessman worth I don't know how many million doing comedy for a hundred bucks a week I couldn't figure that out because at this point I hated my job I would sit on stools in comedy clubs and look at the floor and, but very funny story I was in a hockey rink doing stand up comedy and uh, I'm sitting on a stool and I mean I can't I can barely get the next joke out and I finally look at the audience it was like a late show on a Friday and I look at them there's like 400 people in this place and I said why are we why are you guys here, you know? And some woman in the back, this little voice goes, we just want some jokes. <laughs> and I started laughing. I go, you know, that's reasonable. You know, this is a comedy club. And I managed to get through the show. But that was, I mean, I, I, I don't know if anybody knows what it's like to wake up every day of your life. And then you think, oh, this is going to be a good day. And within a half hour, it just all comes in on you. And, you, and it's just this anxiety and this anxiousness and it's like nothing matters. I mean, it's again, I don't, you know, and then you, I couldn't make enough money to pay the bills and get just all this stuff. So I meet this guy, and now I'm reading Ayn Rand. I'm done with 
self-help and everything, and I'm trying to figure out how to, maybe if I can make enough money now, but you know, now we're losing the house, Tammy would come to me and she'd say, I, th I get the impression you don't care that we're losing everything, and I go, I don't. And she says, who says that? I go, somebody who's being honest with you. I said, I don't care. She goes, I don't understand that. I said, Tammy, you think I don't want to care? You Honestly, do you think I don't want to care? I look around, I got the mortgage, I got the kids, I got the wife. It's solely on me financially. She's a cocktail waitress. She can't make enough. So I, I, but I, I just don't care that the house is going away. They repossessed my car. I don't even know why they sold me the car. I had, I had no money. We were just killing a day. We went to a car dealer. Next thing you know, I'm walking out with a brand new Ford Taurus for 40 grand. I go, I don't even know how to pay for this. So of course, six months later, she calls me on the road. She goes, they just repossessed your car. Your kids are in the driveway crying because they're taking daddy's car. You knew this was coming, you coward. You didn't even tell me it was coming. She's right. I didn't want to have the argument. So here I am uh, with this guy golfing. And I said, how do you accumulate wealth? He said, you could... first of all, he said to me, you don't want a lot of money. I go, I don't? He goes, no, you don't. You can't handle what little you have. And he said, it would be a burden on you. But he said, in order to, uh, uh, to, begin to, uh, to begin to enjoy the creation, you have to have a relationship with the one who created it. And I said, boy, that sounds really kind of cool. Where'd you read it? He said, it's in the Bible. And then uh, he said something else a couple holes later. I said, man, it's really great. Where'd you read it? He goes, it's in the Bible. I said, stop it with the Bible. He goes, what do you mean? I go, who reads the Bible? He goes, what are you talking about? I go, God, God's word. That's a little archaic, isn't it? He goes, what's in the Bible you don't think is true? I go, I don't know. I never read it. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. He said, well, you're not really an atheist. You're a moron, you know. And uh, I go. And understand this. This is a guy that could get me on Augusta National, so I wasn't going to punch him. I mean, you know. And we began a friendship that day. Uh, it's interesting how friendships start, but that was, is, and uh, I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, he said, there's a couple things. One, um, first of all, he said, the Bible's the most influential book in the history of the entire planet. And, and he said, the entire Western civilization, moral foundation is built on the foundation of that one particular book. And uh, it continues to change lives, you know, uh, around the world uh, daily. And you can't even crack it open. That's moronic. You know, at least open it, study it, and then come to your own conclusions. But to ignore it is lazy intellectually and moronic. And um, he said, I go to a church in Denton, Texas, where they teach the Bible, and I'd like to help you out with that and um, uh, sign you up for some study tapes. So I collected them for about a year and a half, and then somewhere in the middle of that, um, Tammy and I were filled out the divorce papers and we come home and these tapes are coming and anyway there was a summer where she said I'm taking the kids I'm going to Ohio and she gathers up all the tapes anyway I, I finally decide I'll open one up and, and in the meantime we had this friendship um, uh, beautiful friendship uh, this loving Christian man um, we talked about things men talk about and then at the end he'd say how are you and Tammy doing I'm going not too good I really think she's going to bail on me I'm trying, Phil, but I just can't seem to get it together. He said, well, we pray for your marriage every night at dinner. And I go, why? And he goes, well, we just like, we want to see it work. We don't think God ordains, puts people together to have them split. So he said, all right, we'll pray for you. I said, that's fine. Doesn't matter to me. Thank you. And um, anyway, my first sermon I ever listened to was on the book of Ecclesiastes. And um, I know people laugh at that, you know. But when I heard meaningless, meaningless, all in life is meaningless, my heart leapt. Because in one 45-minute sermon on the first book, chapter of Ecclesiastes, this pastor in Texas that I never met summed up my eight-year search. Nothing of this earth will give you lasting joy. Nothing. It's temporary. And it all winds up in the land. Solomon's conclusions of chapter one were life without God will have no meaning. Without meaning, there's no purpose. Without purpose, suicide. And if you look around our nation today, my heart breaks for the young men because I know that I see it in their face at the mall, 
I see it at the airport, this glazed over apathy. And you know, they're waking up every day and going, is this all there is? Is this it? Is this my next 15, 20 years? And it was the same with my brother. My brother just couldn't get it. He couldn't get it. He would live on the streets, crack cocaine and all of that. And I would call him and I'd go, bro, I want to give you what I have. I went to Texas after listening to Bible tapes. I, I absorbed the, the Bible for three months, just absorbed it, soaked it in, couldn't believe what I was hearing. When God flips the switch in your heart for his word, it's, it's an amazing transformation. There was a point where I wanted to run on the lawn and hold up the Bible. Has anybody read this? Wow! What a book! Like I was the only one that ever read it, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, when I met you, I, I, God put it on my heart. You were looking for something. And I said, if Jesus is not who he claimed to be, I had done enough Bible study to realize he made some claims. And if he's not who he claimed to be, then Solomon was right. I'm cashing it in. So I will get on my knees in faith and say to Jesus, I am yours. That was 20-some years ago, and uh, I'd love to stand here and tell you how, what a wonderful human being I am, but there's too many golfers here from West Haven that know me. <laughs> and uh, I will tell you what changed. The confusion was gone. The, the need to know why is gone. I got on my knees and I said to Jesus, I said, look, if comedy is what you want me to do, because I'm done, then you're going to have to do something with this. Doors are going to have to open something. I can't keep doing what I'm doing. I've been given an opportunity that I never thought would be possible. The joy that comes, that I get from my job, it's a, it's a hard thing to explain. It really is. I wish I could give it to anybody who, who wants it. I wish I could just pour it into your heart. But Jesus said, if you seek and you knock, he'll answer. So that's the message. And uh, by the way, there is no there. Are we there yet? There is no there, this side of heaven. And um, Tammy and I had a fight last night over a drawer that was open that far. <laughs> she goes to close and she says, I know that last quarter inch is really hard for you to push. <laughs> and I just didn't want to hear it. And I had every intention of holding her, hugging her, and kissing her. And that all went away in 12 seconds. So I thank you for letting me share all that. Uh, life isn't perfect. She started menopause. I mean, really? Come on. There are nights that I lie in bed and dream about the good old days of PMS. So <laughs> you guys have been great. Thank you so much for letting me share all that. Thank you, Wes. God bless you.